Hello, everybody. Uh, this is Brother Luke, Sin City Preacher. Welcome to this episode of Bible Talk with Brother Luke. Uh, I've been doing a series of character studies. Uh, if you haven't uh, seen the previous studies, they're uploaded on my YouTube channel, Sin City Preacher. I've been trying to do these kind of in chronological order as they appear in the Bible. And uh, the previous studies I've done so far is Adam and Eve, uh, Satan, um, Abraham, uh, no, uh, Noah, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph. And now uh, today I'm going to begin the character study on uh, Job. Now, some of you may be wondering, and I'm actually wondering this myself, if I'm doing Job in the proper time frame. And I'm not really sure because it seems to be um, quite a debated uh, question as to what time frame does Job actually fit into. Uh, but so I'm going to go through the book of Job and I'm going to lay a little foundation before I get started. And I'm going to go through it verse by verse. But a couple of things that uh, I think are also important about this study is uh, we're going to see uh, Satan very involved in this story. And so the, the question about Satan is uh, uh, he, he, he fell from heaven. And we know that there's a war between Satan and one of the angels and uh, uh, Michael and the remainder of the angels and they're cast out of heaven. And, uh, and yet in Job, we see that uh, Satan has access to heaven and he's, he's uh, petitioning God and, and uh, having this conversation with God and getting authority from God to do the things that we see uh, in the book of Job. So the timeline of all these events is really quite uncertain. I mean, some people may have a really strong uh, uh, opinion about how they all fit in the, the order of these events. Uh, I'm not one of these people that is uh, so certain about it that I can teach it as, you know, dogmatically. But uh, um, so first, let me examine the question as, uh, you know, when did Job exist? And there's a there's few basic opinions I'll review here. Um, and this is just something I found on uh, Amazing Bible Timeline with World History. And uh, it says, uh, Job is not on the timeline because the biblical scholars cannot agree on when he might have lived. And the Bible does not give enough direct clues to place him accurately. Here are three suggested times Job might have lived by the reasoning of biblical scholars. So the first viewpoint is he lived after the flood and long before Moses. Um, and the references that they use is, uh, it says in Job 22, 16, we'll get to that down the road here in the study. It says Eliphaz refers to the flood as being in the past. So this would indicate that um, Job's time was past the flood. Um, and then also, and Job sacrifices to God as head of his family and such a practice of patriarchal times that stopped with Moses. So these two points here would indicate that it would be um, after the flood and yet before Moses. Um, also, Job's daughters received an inheritance along with his sons. That's Job 42, 15. And that is a patriarchal practice that also stopped with Moses. So these things seem to indicate that Job's time was before Moses and yet after the flood. Another point that supports this position is Job's wealth is determined by flocks rather than money. That is also consistent with patriarchal times. Um, 
another supporting point is uh, Kesata. The Kesata, or piece of money mentioned, belongs to patriarchal times. Uh, the Kesata is the reference to the, the money in Job's time. Um, then the musical instruments, the organ, harp, and timbrel, are the instruments of early Genesis. And finally, uh, Job lived long enough to birth two families of 10 children and raise them to adulthood, then lived another 140 years. He lived at least 200 years, possibly longer. This is consistent with the ages of patriarchs prior to Abraham. So those are some of the reasons that uh, some scholars would say that Job's time frame fits in somewhere after the flood and before Moses. It seems to it seems to make sense, but there are other opinions by other scholars. So this is another viewpoint. That is that Job lived after Joseph, but before Moses. Uh, so this would be significantly after the flood. And this was even following Joseph. And the last character study that, that I did in this whole series was Joseph. And that's why I'm putting uh, the study on, on uh, Job in following Joseph. Not that I am necessarily supporting or defending this time frame. He may have, been, he may have lived much earlier. Or, uh, or later, as we'll see in this third viewpoint. But uh, this is the reason that they think that Joseph may have lived, I mean, uh, Job lived after Joseph and before Moses, is the reasoning for this time placement is that he must have lived between truly righteous men, but not when other righteous patriarchs were alive. Therefore, he is placed between Joseph and Moses. In Job 1.8 is the reference they use to support that. Um, that is, um, to me, it, it doesn't seem to be as convincing as the prior arguments for an earlier uh, time frame for placement for Job. And then the, the third viewpoint is Job lived during Moses' lifetime. And this is one that would be certainly new to me. And it said their argument for that is Job is an associate of Moses' father-in-law. According to this opinion, Moses authored the book of Job. Some say he was one of Pharaoh's advisors, uh, together with Jethro and Balaam. And then there's much more that could be said on this. Uh, so it, the conclusion is there's our problem. Since better biblical scholars than we uh, uh, cannot agree, we, we did not put Job on a timeline. So I've always uh, been uncertain about this. I remain uncertain today as to when Job actually lived. Um, but obviously we know it's somewhere between the flood and, uh, and the, the life of Moses, whether it was... Uh, closer to the flood or closer to Moses or in the middle, I, I'm not really sure. Um, and then the other question, of course, um, is the, this interaction with Satan, and that was, why, why is Satan involved with Job at that point in time in history? Uh, why does Satan have access to heaven? Because we're going to see that Satan is petitioning God, and he's going back to, to, to heaven to um, ask God about Job and get, to get permission from Job, from, from God to inflict, to afflict Job with all these, uh, these uh, horrible things. So the question is, um, uh, did, when did Satan fall from heaven? Uh, we, we know that he was the covering cherubim. He was supposed to be the most beautiful creature. 
uh, and and yet we know that uh, he at one point he was no longer in heaven and we know that he's not in heaven today uh, but does he still have access to heaven it appears that if he was cast down from heaven or it was exiled from heaven um, very early in history some people believe it was uh, uh, before uh, the, before uh, the creation of man and uh, and then some people believe that he was uh, it happened he Satan was like given control over the earth and that's why he was here in the garden and then he fell at that point um, and so it seems that many people think that that Satan, this uh, Satan being cast down from heaven is an ancient event. And then other people think that, no, this is a future event in eschatology and end times. And then other people say, well, what about when Jesus said, I, I saw, I saw uh, Satan cast down from heaven. Was Jesus talking about some prior event? Uh, who knows how, how much earlier in the distant past? Or when his apostles came back and Jesus said, I saw Satan cast down from heaven, was he saying that he just saw him at that moment cast down from heaven? Um, so this is all very, to me, it's, it's all very confusing. It's when did Job live and what, what about uh, Satan? And, and uh, it, so I, I'm leaning towards the idea that Satan uh, lost favor with, with God and was exiled and he he has access to earth uh he couldn't live in heaven but he still had access to heaven he could still come and before god and petition god and that's what's happening here with uh, with job the story of job and then at some point in the future this this battle uh is uh satan and the angels maybe that perhaps is a, a future event uh, because we find it in the book of Revelation, and maybe it's future rather than past. But I, I don't want to teach on that, uh, you know, like I'm, I really understand it. So with all that in mind, let's now take on the book of Job. And uh, I'm going to start with, go, by, go through it verse by verse. There may be some verses I just don't have any comment because I don't claim to understand Job that perfectly. Uh, one other thing I want to say before uh, we, we begin the study on Job itself is that I have in the past uh, used to really struggle with why in the world would God allow Satan to torment Job and make him suffer so much? Maybe you've wondered the same thing. Uh, we know that God loved Job and uh, very much, and, he, and yet look at all the things in the book of Job that Satan was allowed to do to him through with God totally giving him uh, permission to do it. God could have prevented it all, and yet he allowed it all to happen to Job. <clears throat> Once it, I accepted the idea that uh, of why this was allowed to happen, uh, I, I was able to um, not only un uh, appreciate the book of Job from what we can learn from it, but, but realize now, at least I think I understand why God permitted it. And, and my conclusion is that... Uh, we are studying the book of Job today. <clears throat> and ever since the book of Job was written, <clears throat> many people think it was written by Moses, but it's ever since it's been written, people have been reading it and learning from it. So I think that Job went through those experiences. God allowed it all to happen so that you and I could be discussing it today and learn from it. And we're going to learn a lot from it. I think the main thing we learn is no matter 
how bad things happen in our life, we can look at Job as an example of a person who uh, suffered so much and yet his faith remained intact throughout it all. His faith, his love of God, he never would curse God, as he said. His wife told him, and Job never reached that point. He did question God. And uh, so I think that when we, we have these horrible trials and tribulations in our lives, <clears throat> we can question God. Um, but, uh, and sometimes even people today, we can even lose our faith. But thankfully, scriptures tells us that even when we have no faith, he, Jesus, remains faithful because he cannot deny himself. So Job, Job is an example for us, and we can learn from him and this story of Job. Uh, and yet, it doesn't mean that, you know, you and I will always keep our faith from the time we believe till the time of our last breath. We may have doubts. We may end up being getting angry at God and even least leave, leaving the faith. I think that those things do happen. But thankfully, Jesus remains faithful. And uh, even if we lose our faith, he is our faithful Savior God. Okay, so here's Job 1, verse 1. There was a man in the land of Uz, whose name was Job. And that man was perfect and upright, and one that feared God and eschewed evil. Well, I think that uh, this first verse here, obviously, it, it could really uh, give us uh, some some trouble. Uh, and, and that the very first thing is says that Job was perfect and upright. Um, I don't think he was perfect. And uh, and uh, that we we have other verses that we can find in in uh, Psalms and uh, in the New Testament that say that no one is good, no one is righteous, not no, not one. No one has ever been perfect. Everyone falls short of the glory of God. And I think this is comprehensive throughout all history. Well, there's only one exception, and that is the God-man, Jesus Christ. The scriptures tell us that he was perfect, that he never sinned. But many times we see verses that say that, that all of us have sinned. And so I think, uh, in this case, saying he was perfect means that he, he, was, per he was perfectly um, loving God and perfect at doing a lot of things, but it doesn't mean that he was perfect and without sin and never sinned. Um, and, there, and there were born unto him seven sons and three daughters. So just 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, and 500 yoke of oxen, and 500 she asses, and a very great household. So that this man was the greatest of all the men of the East. Well, the men of the East. Um, Maybe we're supposed to think that there were other men that, that were even wealthier or, uh, that were not living in the East. Uh, I've always thought that Job was considered to be the richest man in the world at that time. But certainly we know he had great, great wealth. And let, let me look at this now. As if you know me, you know that I'm a KJV firstist. That term was coined by Brother Joe Byron and it, it contrasts me with the KJV onlyist, in that uh, uh, I will not limit myself to only the KJV, but I do want to look at it first, and then sometimes I do find it helpful to look at another translation. And in this case, I'm going to look at the amplified version, and it says uh, first one and two and three. I'll read. There was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job. And that man was blameless 
and upright, and one who reverently feared God and abstained from and shunned evil because it was wrong. And there were born to him seven sons and three daughters. He possessed 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, 500 female donkeys, and a very great body of servants. So that this man was the greatest of all the men of the East. So, so far we know that Job was a very good man. When I say good, I mean, um, Jesus said only God is good. But that's in God's sight. As men see each other, we see that there's a, uh, a scale, a grading scale. So we see some people as, as better than others. And yet God sees us all as sinners, as the best of our, us are like filthy rags in his sight on, based on our own merit, our own performance. Uh, and yet we know that through faith in Jesus Christ, God, once we put our faith in Jesus, God sees us entirely different. Then we are seen blameless, perfect, sinless, righteous. Uh, but at least compared to other men, Job was the best or one of the best men. And he was also very, very rich. So now let's I'll go back to the KJV verse four. And his sons went and feasted in their houses, every one his day, and sent and called for their three sisters to eat and drink with them. And it was so when the days of their feasting were gone about that Job and sanctified, that, that Job sent and sanctified them and rose up early in the morning and offered burnt offerings according to the number of them all. For Job said, it may be that my sons have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. Thus did Job continually. So we can see at the time of Job, uh, there were burnt offerings. But we can trace the burnt offerings way prior to that. And, and that's why some, some people think that, as I said in the, in the introduction here, that uh, Job took place at the time of Moses, because we know with Moses, he had the burnt offerings, the Mosaic laws, and uh, the sacrificial system. So they might think that that's evidence that Job was in the time of Moses. And yet we can see that... Uh, um, uh, Jacob, uh, Isaac, Abraham, we go back further, they all did these off burnt offerings. We can even trace it back to the earliest burnt offering that I, I found in the scriptures, and that is when uh, Cain and Abel made their offerings to God. Uh, Cain offered uh, his produce that he grew and by the labor of his hands. And it symbolizes, you know, uh, an offering of your own work, your own efforts, works, salvation. It's a picture of that. But Abel uh, offered a blood sacrifice, an animal, of the death of an animal. And that's the sacrifice that pleased God. In my uh, series, The Bloody Trail, I cite dozens and dozens of, of these examples that are pictures of this future sacrifice that God would offer when he offered his son Jesus to be sacrificed for our sins. So the very first appearance of this was the blood sacrifice offered by Abel. So we see that Job is doing this. So in that way, Job could go back even before the flood, and if we want to associate him with blood sacrifices all the time, all the way back to Abel, or all the way up to, to Moses when he was doing the blood sacrifices. Um, um, verse 5, And it was so, when the days of their feasting were gone about, oops, I read that already. Uh, verse 6, now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them. 
So the sons of God, now I've heard people say that there's no reference in the scripture to um, angelic beings ever being called the sons of God. And they think that the sons of God can only refer to men. This is an argument in the, that takes place, and this is an argument that I've never participated in because I don't feel strongly enough about it to argue either side. But it's the argument about the Nephilim and the line of, of uh, Shem, uh, I mean Seth. The line of Seth or the Nephilim, or were, were the, the, the sons of God in that case, were they the descendants of uh, Seth, or were they the angels, the sons of God, or were they angelic beings that laid with women? So I'm not going to get in, into that, but I, I will say that here we have this term, the sons of God. And, um, you know, is this... It says in verse 6, Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord. Um, well, I don't see how this could be people uh, unless these people are, uh, they've lived their lives, they've died, and they're up in heaven. And because of their faith, they're with God. But I, I, I would lean more towards the, these are angels. Another, another viewpoint on the sons of God is that uh, um, a son of God is, a, is, a, is, is has to be a direct, um, uh, come directly from God, rather a creation, rather than a procreation. In other words, Adam was the only human being that was physically a creation of God. Um, and then Eve, God took out of Adam. But you and me and everybody else, all the descendants of Adam and Eve, we're, we're not direct creations of God. We are procreations. We're the result of two human beings uniting together and creating offspring. Procreation is man and woman joining and procreating. Uh, whereas plain creation is, is done directly by God. And so the sons of God could be taken to mean that these are the ones that are directly created since angels did not procreate with each other. Each one of them must be a direct creation of God. You start like with Adam and Eve, God created them and then they procreated and, and there's all of us. But with the angels, God created each one of them directly. And if you're a direct creation of God, then you could be called son of God. And Jesus is unique in that he's the only begotten son of, son of God. And he is, he is not like an angel where even though angels are direct creations and called sons of God. Jesus is eternal God Almighty. He does not have a, he's not a creature. He's eternal. He is God himself. Uh, uh, and yet, uh, if you're watching this now and you put your faith in Jesus, if you're a man, you could be called a son of God. Uh, not because your body was directly created by God, you were a result of procreation, but spiritually your birth was directly by God because God put his Holy Spirit into your spirit and made your spirit, brought it to life. It was resurrected as a new life. Uh, the first resurrection is the spiritual resurrection. When we put our faith in Jesus, we're regenerated, we're quickened, we're, our spirit is brought to life because ever since the fall of Adam and Eve, man was born with a living body and a living mind or soul, and yet a dead spirit. And, uh, and that's what happened when Adam and Eve fell. God said, if, if you disobey and eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you will 
certainly die that day. And that we, we know that Adam and Eve lived, you know, 900 years more physically. Uh, they didn't die physically that day. And yet the scripture tells us that they did die that day. And it was a spiritual death. Their, their spirit was, was uh, I believe they had the Holy Spirit. But when they sinned, there, it was their spirit and the Holy Spirit severed. And they were disconnected from God. And their spirit was dead. And when I put my faith in Jesus Christ in December of 1986, the Holy Spirit came into me. I was baptized with the Holy Spirit, uh, indwelled with the Holy Spirit, sealed with the Holy Spirit, and God's Spirit and my spirit have been united, and, and my spirit is alive. And, and that new birth is what makes me a son of God, or you a son of God, or if you're a woman, a, a, a daughter of God, we are all children of God, all of us who put our faith in Jesus. And another uh, almost universal misconception is that every person is a child of God. None of us are children of God until we get born again spiritually. Then we become a child of God. Uh, before we get born again spiritually by through our faith in Jesus Christ. Before that, we're merely uh, 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 creatures. I mean, we're, we're, we're just, we're not children of God. We're just these, I made a, vid a video uh, titled, uh, Zombies Really Do Walk Among Us. It's the walking dead. Everybody who has not put their faith in Jesus is walking around with a dead spirit. And they're not a child of God until they put their faith in Jesus. So the sons of God, it says that, uh, now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord and Satan came also among them. So now were the sons of God, uh, the fallen angels? And Satan brought all the fallen angels with him? Or were the sons of God the, the unfallen angels, the angels who, who sided with God? And, uh, and um, Or is it all of them, all the angels? But we know that Satan was there. And it seems that the angels, the sons of God, and Satan all had, at this point, and Job's, the time of Job, they all had access to God. And verse 7, And the Lord said unto Satan, Whence comest thou? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro in the earth, and from walking up and down in it. So th th this would go along with the school of thought that says that uh, uh, Satan, uh, even though he could not live in heaven, uh, but he uh, but he had access to heaven. He could still come to heaven and petition God, or maybe God was even using him in a way. Um, but his he was really his place was on earth and the scripture says that satan is the god of this world this is his domain so he used to be in heaven and then now we know that he was there at the fall of adam and eve we know that he was walking the earth uh at the time of, of job and uh now is he is he today well according to uh a lot of people, they think that, no, uh, Satan is bound today. Other people think that, no, he will be bound in the future for a, a thousand years. But if you see my playlist on uh, dispensationalism, futurism, preterism, millennialism, all that, uh, I, 
I, I think that there is a lot of um, verses that could support that that Jesus bound Satan while he was living on the earth and it had his earthly ministry. Satan was bound at that time. But whether you believe that or not, we know that uh, Satan is either bound or will be bound in the future, but there is a period where he's not bound and he's walking around and uh, on the earth. And, uh, you know, when Jesus, before he started his ministry, he had to deal with, with Satan and in his uh, 40 days in the, in the desert, he was tempted by Satan. And so verse seven, and the Lord said unto Satan, whence comest thou? Now, when God asks questions, uh, these are rhetorical questions. Because we know that the scriptures tell us that um, God is omniscient. Omniscient means he knows everything. So if he knows everything, why is he asking Satan, uh, whence comest thou? Where have you been? Um, just like he asked Adam and Eve uh, the question in the garden. Uh, and and uh, I forgot what the question was, but it was it was a similar question like this. What, what have you been doing? Uh, are you? And he knows. He knew what Adam and Eve were, had been doing. He knew what they had done. And yet he asked a rhetorical question. Uh, so here's another one. He knows where Satan has been and what he's been up to, but he asked him, whence comest thou? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, from going to and fro in the earth and from walking up and down in it. And the Lord said unto Satan, hast thou considered my servant Job? Uh, that there is none like him in the earth, a perfect and upright man, one that feareth God and escheweth evil. So this is the beginning of, of Satan's interaction with Job and God in this, this play. It's a, like a Shakespearean drama, but great, greater it's, uh, that's going to happen here. And so for some reason, for God's reason, he brings up Job. And so he's, he's beginning this. Uh, it wasn't Satan that first brought up Job. It was God himself. So why would he ask Satan, have you considered my servant Job? And then he talks about how wonderful he is. Then Satan answered the Lord and said, doth Job fear God for naught? Um, let's look at that in the Amplify. We'll go to verse 9. Then Satan, then Satan answered the Lord, Does Job fear God for nothing? Hmm. That didn't help me. Let's go to uh, verse 10. Hast not thou made a hedge about him? and about his house, and about all that he hath on every side. Thou hast blessed the work of his hands, and his substance is increased in the land. But put forth thine hand now, and touch all that he hath, and he will curse thee to thy face. So, this is the beginning of the argument between Satan and God about man and mankind. Um, Job is the representative of mankind. Now, he's, he's a, he's a uh, representative, but he's the best. He's the best that mankind has to offer. And he has faith in God. He loves him. He reveres him. He fears him, but that's reverence for God. Uh, and, but Satan is just saying, well, the only reason he loves you and reveres you in that way 
is because you bless him so much. So this is the beginning of the argument and kind of not really a wager, but a point. God, both God and Satan are, are want to make a point and they're using Job as the pawn in this in this uh, in this debate about mankind. Verse 12, and the Lord saith unto Satan, behold, all that he hath is in thy power, only upon himself put not forth thine hand. So Satan went forth from the presence of the Lord. Let me look at that in the Amplified, verse 12. And the Lord said to Satan, the adversary and the accuser, these are titles for Satan, the adversary and the accuser. The accuser means that he's, he's the one pointing the finger at man. He's not happy with the creation of man. Uh, and we know that Satan and the angelic beings they existed before mankind. How long before man? Who knows? It could have been, who knows? Maybe, maybe there wasn't even time. But I think time, there had to be time because time is dictated by motion. In order for there to be no time, there has to be no motion because time, Time is measured by motion. How long does it take my hands to get to here from here, from here to here? If everything stood still, then time wouldn't exist. So um, it could have been uh, hundreds of years or thousands or millions or trillions of years uh, between God's uh, interaction with the angelic beings and then his creation of mankind. Uh, it could have been a very short time. I, there's nothing, if you know something that would tell us more on that, then let me know. But we, we do know that when man was created, Satan is not happy because he's constantly wants to point the finger at man and accuse man. And so he, Satan does not love mankind. Seems like from the beginning, he's, he's hated us. Um, so he says, uh, I'm going to read it in the Amplified here. Have you not put a hedge about him and his house and all that he has on every side? You have conferred prosperity and happiness upon him in the work of his hands, and his possessions have increased in the land. But, but put forth your hand now and touch all that he has, and he will curse you to your face. And the Lord said to Satan, the adversary and the accuser, Behold, all that he has is in your power. Only upon the man himself put not forth your hand. So Satan went forth from the presence of the Lord. So it seems that up to this point, uh, Satan had no power, no authority or ability to afflict Job in any way. But uh, at this point, God gives him permission. Now, how does that strike you? As I said earlier, I had a problem with that for a long time. I couldn't understand why God would allow Satan to cause all these horrible things to happen to Job. He, Satan couldn't have done it unless God allowed it. Now, it's, it's not as the Calvinists would say that that uh, God made it all happen. He controlled it. He, uh, he, he made Satan do everything. No, he, he allowed Satan to do it, but he didn't. Satan chose to do what he would do. So Satan had the ability to do whatever he wanted to do, except for directly on Job. All his property, his family, he could attack them, but he couldn't attack Job directly. Uh, so... But, but Satan got to choose how he's going to afflict him. And so mankind 
We are not puppets of God where God is controlling every movement, every action, every word, every thought that we do. If that was the case, then mankind would not be guilty. We would be simply innocent puppets and God would be the guilty party. God would be the one actually committing sins. He's just using, controlling us as puppets, making a sin. Therefore, God would be the guilty party. That's the, the most horrible thing about Calvinism. I mean, I hate everything about Calvinism, but that is I, what I hate the most. Um, Calvinism is false. I have a playlist, Calvinism debunked. So if you are a Calvinist or if you thinking about Calvinism or you don't know anything about Calvinism, watch that and you'll see the historical origins of Calvinism and the biblical proof against Calvinism. But here we see that for some reason, God gives permission to Satan to do bad things that really hurt Job, not directly. But uh, as I said earlier, my conclusion and the comforting thing to me is that God allowed all this to happen so that you and I can be talking about Job today and be inspired and know that, look, bad things happen to good people and that uh, uh, we, uh, no matter what happens to us, let's compare it to Job and it gives us perspective. I remember last year I had... Uh, went in for back surgery and it didn't go well. I, I ended up having to have three surgeries in uh, seven days. And then when I was able to get out of the hospital, I had to go back in, there's complications. And it was, it got worse and worse, just one bad thing after another. It seemed like uh, every day or every week, I, there was more bad news. And I really started questioning God, are you, are you going to, you know, I, I, I'm praying, uh, my friends are praying, family's praying, and, and yet look at all the suffering I'm going through. And then when they were letting me out of the hospital finally to come home again, I was waiting in the hallway. You know, I was in a wheelchair waiting in the hallway for them to take wheel me out. And they, there was a, a doctor went into the, hospital room across from mine and I couldn't see anything but I could clearly hear the conversation and the doctor said to the patient uh, did you get the test results yet and the lady said uh, no the doctor said well it is cancer and you can you can get radiation and chemo but considering your age maybe you won't want to do that and that gave me a perspective, kind of like the perspective we get from Job. I thought, here I am, all feeling sorry for myself and uh, questioning God. And why aren't you answering my prayers? And why is it getting worse all the time instead of better? And, and then I see that, wait a second. The perspective is, you know, I, I haven't been diagnosed with a fatal illness. This is not terminal. It's hard, but it's not terminal. Kind of like you, you feel bad when you have no shoes and until you meet the man who has no feet. And this is what we get from the book of Job. If we get perspective. So now let's go to, um, We're going to go to uh, verse 13 in the KJV. And there was a day when his sons and his daughters were eating and drinking wine in their eldest brother's house. And there came a messenger unto Job and said, the oxen were plowing and the asses feeding beside them. And the Sabians fell upon them and took them away. Yea, they have slain the servants with the edge of the sword. And I only am escaped alone to tell thee. So this is the beginning of the sorrows that uh, Job will be facing. Uh, 
Right. While he was yet speaking, there came also another and said, The fire of God has fallen from heaven and hath burned up the sheep and the servants and consumed them. And I only am escaped alone to tell thee. While he was yet speaking, there came also another and said, The Chaldeans made out three bands and fell upon the camels and have carried them away, yea, and slain the servants with the edge of the sword. And I only am escaped alone to tell thee. While he was yet speaking, there came also another and said, Thy sons and thy daughters were eating and drinking wine in their eldest brother's house. And behold, there came a great wind from the wilderness and smote the four corners of the house. And it fell upon the young men, and they are dead. And I only am escaped alone to tell thee. Wow. Just put yourself in Job's shoes for a moment. How'd you like, have you ever had bad news in your life? I mean, that's, that's a lot of bad news. One thing after another. That would be, be crushing. Let's see Job's response. Verse 20. Then Job arose and rent his mantle and shaved his head and fell down upon the ground and worshipped. <laughs> worshipped. Worshipped. Wow. It said, Naked came I out of my mother's womb, and naked shall I return thither. The Lord gave, and the Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. In all this Job said not, nor charged God foolishly. Sorry. How would you respond? I don't know. If I suffer such loss, would I fall down and worship God and say, I came with not into the world with nothing. You have that kind of perspective. I'll read it again in the Amplified. However, I don't think it's necessary, really. Then Job arose and rent his robe and shaved his head and fell down upon the ground and worshiped and said, Naked without possessions came I into this world from my mother's womb and naked Without possessions shall I depart. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed praise and magnified and worship be the name of the Lord. In all of this, Job sinned not, nor charged God foolishly. I hope I can hold up through this study. I, I was worried about this happening. I am sorry. I'm... I'm be 65 years old soon and uh, it seems that uh, things affect me more than they used to when I, when I when I read this I hope I can just contain myself all right so that's a good point to stop the end of chapter one uh, In all this, Job said not, nor charged God foolishly. Well, there are so many examples that we have, historic examples throughout the scriptures of great faith. I know that some people teach that Paul is our example. Paul is our apostle. 
and I, I can't think of any Christian. I mean, not, not one person since the cross to now that I admire more than the Apostle Paul. But he's not our only example. Jesus himself is also our example. He, the way he lived his life was an example. And the contrast between Jesus and Muhammad, you know, Muhammad says, cut off their heads. Jesus says, turn the other cheek. Muhammad says, tax them and enslave them. Jesus says, love your enemies. Jesus set an example for us. He said, there's no greater love than being willing to lay down your life for a friend. And that's what he did. Job is an example and many others. But as we go through this book of Job, it's gonna take quite a while. There's over 40 chapters and uh, we're going to see that Job has gone through so much and we see a great example of faith in Job. But I don't want to make any video without saying to you what is the most important point of the Bible. This is the Bible. There's 66 books in the Bible. 39 books in the Old Testament. That's before, before the cross. 27 books in the New Testament. The New Testament is, begins with the death of the testator. Jesus Christ died on the cross. And then after that, everything written is the New Testament. But you could read this, you could study it, you could memorize it. But if you miss this one point, then you're a failure. It does you no good. And the point is that every person ever born since Adam and Eve is born with a birth defect. It's a sin nature. It's natural for us to sin. No one had to teach you how to sin. You were probably two or three or four years old when you started lying and you figured it out all for yourself. No one taught you. Lying, envy, jealousy, anger, violence, dishonesty, all these things come so naturally to us. And why is that? It's because, as I said, when Adam and Eve fell, their spirit was connected with God and it was severed and sin separated. The Holy Spirit, God's spirit could not be connected because of man's sinful nature that he had. And everybody born since Adam and Eve was born with that birth defect, it's the sin nature. It's, it's, it's a genetic defect. It's a, it's a disease that we're all born with. There's a cure, though, for the disease. And uh, it's the blood of Jesus Christ. You need a blood transfusion. You need the blood of Jesus Christ that was shed for our sins. You need to receive that in faith. That that's, that's the substitution. His death was a substitution for our death. So um, we're, walk, we're walking around like zombies with a living body and a living mind and a dead spirit. And there's, you need to be born again from above, born again spiritually. And that happens when you put your faith in Jesus. I want you to know who he is, first of all. The scriptures say that Jesus 
is God. He is not a creature like an angel. He does not have a beginning or an ending. He is God himself. And Jesus said that he came down from heaven and became a man so that he could give his life as a ransom. A ransom is a payment made to set someone free. And the payment Jesus made was his blood and his death on the cross. That was the payment. And he set us free from a guilty judgment. Guilty judgment and be sentenced into the lake of fire where we suffer the second death. So, if you want to be born again, if you want to have eternal life, all that is required of you is put your faith in this Jesus. Jesus is God who died for our sins. God who became a man and died for our sins. Put your faith in him. Believe in him and what he's done for you. And then what happens is that you receive the gift of eternal life. The Bible says the wages of sin is death because man is a sinner, man, all of mankind will die. You're going to die. You might die today. Sometimes death comes suddenly. The Bible says life is like a vapor. It appears for a short time and then disappears. But sometime before we die, we have the ability to exercise our free will and choose to put our faith in Jesus. And if you put your faith in Jesus, then you receive a gift and it's eternal life. So even though we die, when we put our faith in Jesus, our spirit is brought to life and our bodies will be resurrected from the dead and we will live forever in the kingdom of God because of our faith in Jesus. Now, Paul says that we should remember the gospel that he taught. That is that Christ died for our sins. He was buried and on the third day he was raised from the dead. The significance of him dying on that cross is that our sins are paid for. If you're trying to get to heaven by stopping your sin and doing good things and thinking that if I can do a lot of good and very, very eliminate my sin, the scale will tilt in my favor and God will approve me. Romans 10.3 says that you're trying to establish your own righteousness and that doesn't work. That's not God's way. God's way is you putting your faith in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. So put your faith in Jesus and his righteousness is then credited to you. And this, so the, the significance of that death on the cross is that sin is no longer a barrier between man and God. God's Holy Spirit will unite with your spirit and you'll be brought to life spiritually. The Bible says that you will be baptized with the Spirit, indwelled with the Spirit, sealed with the Spirit, and He will never leave you or forsake you. It's irreversible if you put your faith in Jesus. Uh, but the, the significance of the resurrection of Jesus is Jesus said that He would give us a sign to prove His claims were true. His claims of deity, that he is God Almighty who became a man. His claims that he was the only way to receive eternal life. He's the way, the truth, and the life. No man come on that of the Father but by him. His claims that he will resurrect you in eternal life if you put your faith into him. He said he would raise himself from the dead as a sign to prove that his claims are true. He's God and Savior. And he will give you eternal life and you can trust him. That's what I'm going to ask you to do right now. 
trust Jesus Christ. Put your faith in him. Stop trying to get to heaven through your own efforts. Surrender. Say, I give up. I know I can't do it. I need Jesus to be my savior. And from here on, just rely completely on Jesus Christ. Depend on him. And put no faith in yourself. Put all your faith in Jesus, our great savior God. Will you do it? I hope you do. If you do put your faith in Jesus today, make a comment on this video, please. And I hope you'll join me uh, every Sunday and Wednesday at 1 p.m. Pacific time for another episode of Bible Talk with Brother Luke. Bless you all in the name of our great Savior God, Jesus Christ.